All right, so this is the last of the three lectures about the thigh region, and in this lecture we're going to be talking about the nerves and the clinical pearls. So first the obturator nerve. We've broken it down here into its motor innervation and sensory innervation. We do this for all these nerves so that you can keep those straight. Uh, motor innervation, it does muscles of the medial compartment of the thigh, which, as we've talked about, are responsible for adduction of the hip. Note, it does not innervate the obturator internus muscle. So definitely make note of that. Um, you definitely don't want to get tripped up on that on an exam. Sensory innervation does skin on the medial aspect of the thigh. So there's a patch of you know, skin down here on the inner thigh that is done by obturator nerve. And that's easy to remember. You know, it does the medial compartment, which is on the medial you know, aspect of the thigh, and then the skin just over that. So that's easy to remember. It arises from the L2 to L4 nerve roots. This could be important to know for an anatomy exam of the lumbar plexus. So remember, it's a lumbar plexus nerve. So here's a great picture of the lumbar plexus here in the abdomen and the pelvis. And, you know, these labels are way too small, so we blew this up and we labeled it so you could clearly see it here. Here's the obturator nerve coming off those L2 to L4 nerve roots. Initially, it travels through the psoas major muscle. Now, the psoas is actually cut away in this diagram, so here's the psoas right here. This is more the distal part that ends up going down into the thigh and inserting onto the lesser trochanter. And it travels through the psoas muscle, and that's a good landmark uh, in the cadaver lab, you'll actually see the nerve exiting out through the muscle. And it emerges from the medial border near the pelvic brim. And then it descends adjacent to the common iliac. So you can see that here. Here's the aorta. Here it branches into the common iliacs. Here's obturator nerve traveling just adjacent to those. And then the internal iliac and then the, the ureter as well, which would be traveling down in this region to enter the bladder right here. It enters the thigh through the obturator canal within the obturator membrane. So again, it's going to go through this region here as well. Upon exiting the obturator canal, so it's going to be kind of deep to this pectineus muscle. It's going to come out right here, and you can see it here. Here's the anterior division of the obturator. The posterior division dives back this way. So it divides in the anterior and posterior branches, and they course around the obturator externus and adductor brevis muscles. Here's your adductor brevis. Longus is kind of cut away here, as you can see. So here's your brevis. Here's the anterior division traveling here, posterior division traveling back here. So in a sense, just remember that it bifurcates and, sp and, and its two branches wrap around adductor brevis. The anterior branch, it travels between adductor brevis and adductor longus. So here's adductor longus here, cut away. Here's the anterior division right here, traveling right there. And then the posterior branch travels between adductor brevis and adductor magnus. So your main is AB here, posterior, anterior division. adductor brevis. So back here is adductor magnus. And then in front here is AL, adductor longus. So that's how you can keep that straight. And then they've bifurcated from just proximal to that. Genital femoral nerve. So we talked about this in the abdomen. We'll talk about it here because it's relevant to the thigh region. So motor innervation doesn't do any motor innervation in the thigh. Sensory innervation does the skin over the upper, anterior, and medial areas of the thigh. So kind of in this region right here, near the genital region. And the femoral branch, which is responsible for this innervation, uh, the genital branch goes into you know, the genital region. And then the femoral branch, it enters the thigh deep to the inguinal ligament. So we have the inguinal ligament here. Here's your genital femoral nerve traveling here. It's nice and thin coming off the lumbar plexus. It comes down here. Here's the psoas. It, it goes through the psoas here, and then it goes deep to the inguinal ligament right here. And you can see the branch kind of coursing like that. So the femoral nerve, major nerve in the thigh region. Motor innervation does muscles of the anterior compartment of the thigh, which are responsible for knee extension. So that's your quadriceps. So when you think femoral nerve, think quadriceps, knee extension. So sensory innervation, it's got two main branches here. First, the anterior femoral cutaneous nerve which does the skin over the anterior medial region of the thigh. So, you know, this whole region right here, and then kind of the medial down here. Then it has a sural nerve, which we'll show in a few slides here. And that is a branch that come, comes off the terminal portion of the femoral nerve. And this does skin of the medial leg and foot. So it more does innervation down uh, distal to the knee than so much the thigh region. It arises from the L2 to L4 roots. This could definitely be important to know of the lumbar plexus, and then it pierces the psoas major muscle. So here's the femoral nerve right here. Psoas, again, it's cut right here, so it would pierce through that. 
So femoral nerves coming out this way, nice big nerve traveling in the pelvis here. And then it passes between the iliacus and the psoas major muscles. And you can see that here. So here's the iliacus here. Iliacus is this broad muscle that originates from the iliac crest here in the pelvis. Travels down this way like this. Here's psoas right here. So you can see it traveling just between those two muscles there. Then it enters the thigh lateral to the femoral artery for the femoral triangle. You know, nerve, artery, vein, empty space, uh, lymphatics. So it enters lateral to the femoral artery beneath the inguinal ligament and then enters the femoral triangle. So the saphenous nerve is strictly a sensory nerve, so no motor innervation at all anywhere in the lower extremity. Sensory, it, does, it doesn't do any in the thigh region. It's more down in the medial aspect of the leg and the ankle region. It's a branch off the femoral nerve, so here's the saphenous. And you'll notice that, so here's your inguinal ligament right here, and once the femoral nerve comes out from under the inguinal ligament, it kind of sprays out into all these different branches here to innervate all these muscles, gives off that anterior cutaneous branch to then go on and do the skin over this region. And then as it comes down here, it gives off this saphenous nerve. And the saphenous nerve, it branches off the femoral nerve in the femoral triangle region. And so if you remember, here's sartorius down here. Here's this uh, adductor longus here. We already did the inguinal ligament. So it's going to branch off right here in this region of the femoral triangle. Then it travels with the femoral artery into the adductor canal. So, you know, this canal region right here. And then within the canal, it actually breaks away from the femoral artery. So if you remember, the femoral artery exits the canal in the adductor hiatus down here in the adductor magnus tendon. And instead, the saphenous nerve, ex it breaks away from the femoral artery, and it exits beneath the lower edge of that aponeurosis coming off of vastus medialis. Remember, the aponeurosis that forms the adductor canal is coming off of vastus medialis. So the saphenous nerve breaks away with femoral artery, and then it exits the canal beneath that, that aponeurosis. Then it descends down, so you can see it here, and it's descending down the medial side of the knee. So here's the knee right here, just deep to the sartorius muscle. Then it pierces the fascia lata, that thick fascia encasing the thigh, and then it becomes subcutaneous. So it travels just below the skin, and then it, you know, it goes on to carry on its function of cutaneous sensory innervation in the leg and in the ankle region. Posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. So here it's labeled right here. Coming out here, as you can see, it's coming out of the greater sciatic foramen, just inferior to piriformis muscle. Does not do any motor innervation. Sensory innervation, it does skin of the posterior thigh, posterior knee, and a portion of the proximal posterior leg, so a lot of posterior cutaneous innervation. They have some branches that provide some cutaneous innervation to the buttocks and the genital region. So that'd be like this perineal branch that's coming off here and going off to do uh, buttocks and genital region innervation. Within the thigh, it travels deep to the fascia lata, so just deep to that thick fascial case around the thigh, and so it travels down there. And then eventually it passes posterior to the long head of the biceps, femoris muscle, where it then travels posterior to the knee and ends about midway down the posterior leg. So it goes way below the knee and ends about in the mid-region of the, of the leg. And the sciatic nerve, as you know, it comes off the sacral plexus, goes into the gluteal region, the thigh region, then it actually bifurcates in the knee region. So here in the thigh region, it's still one nerve and it has a tibial division and a perineal division. And uh, as you remember, when we talk about innervation for the thigh muscles, this came up. So tibial division innervates the hamstring muscles of the posterior compartment of the thigh. So, and that makes sense. It's traveling here in the posterior compartment. It's going to innervate these muscles. Perineal division innervates the short head of the biceps femoris. Remember, that's a unique thing about that short head. Sensory innervation doesn't really do any sensory in the thigh region, more so down in the leg and in the feet. Travels in the posterior compartment of the thigh between the adductor magnus and then the long head of the biceps femoris. So you can see it traveling down here like this. Here's biceps femoris right here. So it's traveling between, deep to that and then superficial to adductor magnus down here in this medial region. Dermatomes. So we'll just go over this briefly. You know, this is something where well, this is a general map. It, you know, if you could look in five different textbooks and see five different dermatome maps. Again, just go with what your class has. And then as far as the boards go, just know the general. They're not going to ask you specific dermatomes. Just know where certain nerves innervate, you know, medial versus lateral, anterior versus posterior. So anterior femoral cutaneous nerve, remember, it's a branch off the femoral nerve. That's going to do a lot of the anterior medial region. You have this lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. This is uh, a nerve we talked about in the abdomen region, comes off the lumbar plexus. The medial region does a few things. So you have the obturator which does a region here. You have genitofemoral here. 
So those are two nerves that do, along with anterior uh, femoral cutaneous, do the medial aspect. Posterior aspect, as you can see, is pretty much dominated by posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. All right, so now we're going to finish out with some relevant clinical pearls to the thigh region. A femoral shaft fracture, so it causes high energy trauma, falls in the elderly, gunshot wounds. Presentation, pain, tenderness, and swelling. Obviously, you know, they broke the thickest bone in the body, so there's obviously going to be a lot of pain, a lot of swelling, inflammation going on here. The major complication is the blood loss, because you can see a lot of blood vessels traveling in here if one of them gets nicked. Treatment, you got to do surgery. You can't have people walking around with a broken femur. So obturator nerve injury, this is very high yield for a board exam. you got to know this. It can, and what's important to know is it can be injured during pelvic or abdominal surgery because if you see here, here's the obturator nerve traveling in here off the lumbar plexus, starts out in the abdomen, then goes through the pelvis, and then makes its way into the thigh region. Now, a typical example would be is that, say, a woman has you know, a hysterectomy for uterine cancer, so gynecological procedures, a cystectomy for bladder cancer, prostatectomy for prostate cancer, and it's especially usually when it involves dissection of lymph nodes around the obturator nerve. So if you look down here, here's the aorta bifurcating into the iliac, common iliac arteries. Here's all these lymph nodes. So, you know, when you do cancer surgery, you want to take lymph nodes because you want to prevent any kind of spreading. You want to make sure you get as much of the cancer as possible out. So when a surgeon dissects down in here, they need to be very careful of taking out these iliac or obturator nodes because they're right near this obturator nerve. Because if you look this region here where the iliac is, the obturator nerve travels right here near the iliac. So the obturator nerve is at risk for being injured. And so the way this would present itself is, for example, you know, a woman has a hysterectomy for uterine cancer. There was some uh, iliac or obturator nodes dissected out. And then it, show, it says that you know, the patient presents on follow-up with weak or absent adduction because the obturator nerve innervates the adductors of the thigh region, as you can see here. And it can also manifest as gait or balance problems because being able to adduct your thigh also helps you, you know, walk, it helps you balance. So this is another way it can manifest. So that's usually how a test question would be is, you know, they had some kind of procedure for cancer, there was some kind of lymph nodes dissected out, and it injured the obturator nerve, and then here, they're, here we are with this problem. They also have numbness on the medial side of the thigh. So a few ways they could ask this, they could say what nerve was injured, they could say what, what lymph nodes were, were likely dissected, something like that. It's usually going to be a secondary type question. So peripheral artery disease of the lower extremity, this is also very high yield for board exams. So what it is is it's atherosclerotic narrowing of arteries that supply the lower extremity. And the big thing here is, you know, versus, you know, atherosclerosis in the heart where you get a heart attack here, you get limb ischemia, and then eventually a patient could unfortunately have to have an amputation. Very common problem in the United States. So very important to know. Risk factors, very similar to heart disease. Smoking is the, is the very big one. So if they ask, you know, this is often considered the number one risk factor for peripheral artery disease. Diabetes, another huge one. This, you know, unfortunately, a lot of diabetics who don't have their disease well controlled have to have amputations for this reason. Dyslipidemia, hypertension, and then just older age. Presentation. So there's two main presentations you'll see for peripheral artery disease, especially on the board exam. Is the first is intermittent claudication. This is very important. So what this is is lower extremity pain. So it's pain in the legs usually described as someone who, when they're walking, they have pain in their legs and then it's relieved when they rest. And it can often be confused with spinal stenosis. So spinal stenosis can present this way. One way you differentiate this is, is that spinal stenosis, is, especially on a board exam, is going to be almost always bilateral versus this could be unilateral. I guess theoretically also could be bilateral. The other thing is, is you know, patients with spinal stenosis are going to have back pain. These patients aren't likely going to have back pain. It's going to be more isolated to the legs. And, and then they're also going to have a lot of these risk factors. So it's again with the boards, it's all about context. And you know, also this is clinically important as well. You know, if you have a patient you're trying to figure out what's wrong with them, you're going to ask them, are you a smoker? Are you diabetic? Is it controlled? Do you have high blood pressure? All these things play in. So this is a, definitely an important presentation to be aware of. This you know definitely should go off in your head if you see this. You know, someone's walking, they have pain in their legs, and then it's relieved with rest. Critical limb ischemia is when this pro progresses and is not treated, so untreated claudication progresses to pain that is felt in the leg or feet even when someone's resting. So someone's sitting down, they still have leg pain. doesn't matter if they're exerting themselves or not. It's almost like stable angina versus unstable angina. Remember, stable angina is when someone exerts themselves and then it's not present when they're resting. And then unstable angina, which is much more serious, is you know even when someone's resting, they have chest pain. 
Now the big thing here is with critical limb ischemia is you can have tissue loss via arterial insufficiency, ulcers, and gangrene. So a lot of times these people will kind of have ulcers. It's really gross and very graphic to see. So they'll have ulcers on their, on their feet or on their legs. Usually it's on their feet or the soles of their feet. So diagnosis, first thing you'll do is an ankle brachial index. And what this is, is you'll put a blood pressure cuff around the ankle. You'll put a blood pressure cuff around the arm, similar to, you know, when you get your blood pressure taken at the doctor's office. So you'll take this ankle blood pressure and divide it by the brachial blood pressure. And that's going to give you a ratio. And so the important thing really to know is 1.0 to 1.2 is considered normal. Okay. So that's the normal range. Anything greater than that or lower than that is at risk for it. Now there's a lot of different classifications. That's way beyond of what we're going to talk, talk about here, especially for an anatomy course. If you're very interested, you could definitely Google it and find it, but definitely know this range, you know, would be important to know. And if it's greater or less than the other way is Doppler ultrasound. That'll show you, you know, clot formation and, and, you know, disease, you know, disease of and hardening of the arteries. And then you can also do angiography, which will give you a nice picture of the vessels and, and show you areas where there's uh, decreased perfusion. Just like if you did an angiography for, you know, pulmonary embolism or for a coronary uh, angiography as well. Treatment, big thing here is you start with risk factor reduction. So quit smoking, control your diabetes better, lose weight, lower your cholesterol, lower your blood pressure, those type of things. And then if those don't work or if the disease is so bad, then you can do angioplasty. So you can put stents in arteries in the lower extremity as well. Femoral, femoral artery stents are a very common procedure. Psoas tendonitis, inflammation or partial tearing of the psoas tendon. So you have the iliacus muscle here, the psoas major muscle here, and they come together to form the iliopsoas muscle. And then they come down and the tendon comes down and inserts here on the lesser trochanter. So the presentation is going to be pain in the hip region or the groin, inner thigh, you know, in here where it's inserting in this region here on the inner thigh. And it is worse with hip flexions. And that makes sense because these muscles are hip flexors. So if you you know you move them, it's gonna exacerbate the pain. And usually they won't say in the board question, they won't say hip flexion. They'll say, oh, it's when the patient gets up from a chair, gets out of a car, walking upstairs. These are all motions that involve significant hip flexion. So you definitely wanna be aware of that. When, when in the boards, if you think it's musculoskeletal and they're describing where it's pain with some kind of motion, you wanna be thinking about what type of action is that? Is it hip flexion, hip extension? If it's an upper extremity thing, is it elbow flexion? Is it shoulder abduction? You know, those type of things. That's, those, that's the way you kind of want to be thinking about these presentations. Physical exam, pain to palpation over the tendinous insertion on the lesser trochanter. As far as treatment goes, you can have them rest it, give some NSAIDs to help calm the inflammation down. If it's really bad, you can stick a, actually a steroid injection in here in this location right over the lesser trochanter. That's kind of your landmark. Stick the steroid in there, and hopefully that calms it down, and then you can give them some physical therapy. So an abscess can develop in the psoas muscle. So here's the psoas muscle right here. And the reason for that is that the transversalis fascia of the internal abdominal wall is actually continuous with the fascia around the psoas muscle. And so the psoas muscle has this fascia that encases it, and it extends from the abdomen pelvis region and all the way into the thigh region. This fascia casing the muscle and extends into the thigh region with the muscle. And so a retroperitoneal pyogenic infection in the abdomen or the pelvis can actually form a so and so as abscess because it's continuous with that fascia. So you can have an abscess here within the muscle and it can travel along the muscle here. It can extend all the way down in with, encased in this sheath. And it can pass between the psoas fascia and the muscle to reach the inguinal and even the proximal thigh regions down here because the muscle goes all the way down here and the fascia goes Presentation is going to be severe pain in the inguinal and or proximal thigh regions because of where the, th the psoas muscle travels. It can radiate to the hip, the distal thigh, or the knee. Patients can often have signs of infection, so fever. Very often they can have inability to bear weight because they have so much pain that it's so painful for them to walk or put any weight. Physical exam, they're going to have a palpable tender mass, so that's going to be your abscess in the proximal thigh region here. And then they could also have psoas sign where they flex their th they flex their hip and that exacerbates the pain. Diagnosis, you're going to do an ultrasound. You'll see in the abscess and they can confirm it with a CT. So for the treatment, you're going to do a percutaneous drainage. It's going to be either ultrasound or CT guided, so image guided drainage with a needle. So that's basically percutaneous. You stick a needle through the skin here and then you use ultrasound or CT to guide you and then you remove the abscess that way. 
hamstring injury here, so pulling a hammy, pulled or torn hamstring muscles. Remember our hamstring muscles here on the back side here, really in this region here and here. So it's really, you know, these muscles of these tendons here. Common to people who run too hard, such as athletes that play basketball, soccer, or tennis, especially if there's not proper stretching involved either, or if someone who's really out of shape goes and runs a lot, they can easily have an hamstring muscle. Best treatment for this is just rest and better stretching. All right, that concludes our discussion of the nerves and clinical pearls relevant to the thigh region, and that concludes our entire discussion of the thigh region. Next, we're going to talk about the knee joint.